Hi, my name's Sally and this is a research presentation that I did for Dragon Boat ACT last year. I love Dragon Boat paddling, so much so that I devoted part of my master's degree to researching it. And I've actually developed the first Dragon Boat application that's paddler built in Australia and I really want to launch it. We're running a campaign at the moment to get enough money to launch in April and I would really love it if at the end of this video you could go to the link and pledge. I hope you enjoy the video, that you get lots out of it and that you also help support me in launching the first ever Paddler Built Dragon Boat app for Australian racing. I've been paddling since 2011. I'm a bit of a group jumper. I've been a part of the Uni Dragons, I've been a part of the Ice Dragons and now I coach Diamond Phoenix. Uh, I've paddled for Australia twice and I've paddled for ACT three times. Um, at the last Australian campaign in Hungary I was lucky enough to jump in with a youth crew. I was just on the age cutoff and we ended up getting three gold medals. So we're, we're doing quite well on a, on a world stage and hopefully this research will assist people in um, increasing, further increasing the performance in their own clubs and that will also filter into our elite competition as well. So, one I want to start with is looking at a little bit of physiology. Now, the first thing we have to look at is what, what is uh, metabolism, because it, this refers a lot to metabolism and how you create energy inside your body. And so there's three different kinds of, you know, three, three broad categories of metabolism. There's the ATPPC system, there's the glycolytic system, and there's the aerobic system. Now, if we look at our races, I haven't got a big picture of this, but I'm just going to talk you through it. Our 200 meter race at an elite level goes for around 40, 45 seconds. Okay, now the anaerobic system goes for about 60 seconds. So you're looking at, you know, if we were looking at energy consumption, we would say that the majority of a 200 meter race actually comes from anaerobic metabolism. And anaerobic metabolism means you don't need oxygen. So you know, your first five strokes feel awesome, and then as you get out through your race start, you start to get huffy puffy. It's because your body is switching between the two metabolisms. And they don't all act in isolation, they actually combine and they overlap, and one will be more dominant than the other at a particular time period. So for our 60 seconds, we say that the majority of metabolism comes from the glycolytic and ATP PC systems. Um, now they're, they're the anaerobic energy systems. If you're looking at the first five strokes, as I said, then we're looking at purely this kind of energy. And this is stored in your body as, as basically as phosphocreatine. When that breaks up, it creates energy. Okay? Now when we get to the huffy puffy kind of 2K exercise, that's when we get to aerobic metabolism. Now the reason I'm trying to give you some context about metabolism is because what we know on a scientific level is quite different to what is occurring on the water, which is something that really interested me about the research that I did. So before I go into that, I'm going to give you a little bit more explanation. Now, the way that we actually measure these things is usually in a lab and it's with a controlled study and it's using a treadmill or a bike or something and we actually measure what the person breathes out to figure out how much oxygen they're consuming and we measure what's happening in their blood. So usually blood lactate and all that kind of stuff. So the kind of tests that appear in this article are total work and total work is in a, a 30 or 60 second test and work is equal to force times distance. So the force that they're applying on the, it's usually a cycle ergometer, so it's, they're cycling, the force that they're applying on the pedal times the distance that they actually pedal, okay, it's the total amount of work that they do. Then the second thing we can look at is peak power, and peak power is related to the amount of work that you do in the amount of time it took you to do that work. So here, if we then go work divided by time, if you can produce work which is force times distance. So if we're looking at our paddling stroke, force you apply in the water times the length of your stroke. If you can do that quickly, then you get an increase in power. If you do it slowly, then you get a decrease in power. Does that make sense? Yep, so peak power is another um, variable that we look at when we're looking at metabolism. 
The last one is the fatigue index, which is where we look at the peak power that a person produces minus the minimum power that they produce. So basically, how, how quickly do they fatigue? At their, at their slowest power, what is happening, and then the difference between the two. The next one is looking, so these are all anaerobic measures, so they fit into here. The next one is aerobic measures, which is VO2 max, and that's usually done on a treadmill or on a bike. And what it is is the volume of oxygen that someone can consume in litres per minute. So while, while we're standing here and breathing, we're consuming oxygen, we breathe it in, it gets converted to carbon dioxide, and we breathe it out. And the gas bag that they put on, big mask, you might have seen it before, is connected to an analyzer, a computer, that can tell you how much oxygen you're consuming in litres per minute. So when we're talking about VO2 max, that will, that's what we're looking at, how much oxygen you're consuming. Okay, so there's, there's another two um, type of measures that occur in this article, and they're strength measures. So we've looked at metabolism in terms of your anaerobic system and your aerobic system, but then we also know that strength plays a factor in what, what you do in your race, how you perform in your race. So there's two different ways that we can measure strength. So we go isokinetic or isometric. Now isokinetic strength is where you produce force at, a same, at the same movement speed. So say for example if you were sitting on a leg curl machine at the gym, you know the one that you have the pad behind you squeeze it up to your bum, the machine would only ever move a certain speed but you still have to apply the, as much force as you can against that pad. So it, what it measures is how much force a muscle can apply at a given speed of contraction. So that's isokinetic. Kinetic means you're moving. Then there's isometric, which means that you're applying force against a fixed object. Your muscle doesn't lengthen, it doesn't shorten, you just apply force. So there's a different way of thinking about them. Uh, isokinetic strength could be likened to, no matter how hard you push your kids in the morning, they will only ever get ready at a set pace, which is snail's pace. Or, isometric strength, when you're caught out in the middle of Civic, and there's only a public toilet available, and you've really got to go, and you're going to do an isometric squat, because you don't ever want to touch whatever's down there. Okay? So isokinetic is like moving your kids along, and isometric is like your toilet squat. Okay? Um, now what we can do to actually relate this to race performance is we can say, okay, um, Sally got all these different scores in all these different tests, and we know that individually these tests can relate to race performance, just one variable can relate to race performance, but when you're out there on the water, it's not only your aerobic system that's working, it also your strength is a factor, and your anaerobic system is a factor. So what we can do is then combine all of these variables together to get a prediction of your race time, and that's called a predictive model. And that's just mathematical, you plug it all in, you come out with an equation, and then based on the scores, you can actually predict what people's race performance would be. It's really interesting. So there's a couple of models that I've got up there. So the predictive model overall is um, how much a bunch of things can explain one thing. So how much all of these variables can explain race performance. Now we actually can predict race performance but we can only predict it, we can't actually measure it with everything going on at the same time, otherwise you'd have electrodes on somebody and then you'd have a gas analyzer on them and then you'd have video analysis on them and it's just not viable for us to do that when you're out on the water in the middle of a race. Um, so what we actually do is we predict it using these mathematical equations with all these tests that are done on dry land and it comes out with an accuracy of the prediction. So let's say for example, we could use a mathematical formula and pull all of these things in to one model and at the end it would say, okay, well, there's a 99% probability that your race performance would be X, would be two minutes. 
or 80% uh, probability that your race performance will be 10 minutes. So that's the kind of way that predictive models work. So we take all these variables, we chuck them into a mathematical formula, and out pops this probability that something is going to occur. And we do that through testing lots and lots of different athletes and figuring out how their race performance works with, the, with all these variables. In terms of my research, what I was actually looking at was uh, race performance in other sports and whether we could apply those similar formulas or the predictive models to our own sport. So previously only physiology has been looked at and there's a girl here in, in my references, Sarah, and she actually mm. has paddled for the Australian team. She went over to Japan and she did her PhD with the Japanese elite paddling team. And she actually got a lot of physiology physiology uh, results from them, a lot of data, and she's been able to look at the difference in metabolism between what we do in a 200 metre and a 500 metre race, which is really interesting, it hasn't been investigated at all before. So what I wanted to do, I didn't want to just do physiology because I know that's been done, what I wanted to do was know if strength played a role. So yes, you can have great aerobic fitness and you can have great anaerobic fitness and you can flush your lactic acid and all that kind of stuff. But if you're weak compared to someone who's strong, is that going to affect your race performance? And based on other sports, we know that yes, that is the case. The stronger people are more fatigue resistant and they perform better than the weaker people. So that's what I wanted to look at for my study. So basically what my results indicate, and I'm gonna start um, going to the key points here. What my results indicate up here, so we see VO2 max, which is the maximal oxygen consumption. We are not fit, <laughs> right? So here's our rowers. Okay, rowers, yeah, they've had a long time to train and compete and everything. The kayakers, way up there. Dragon boat paddlers. So we've got a potential there that we're not aerobically fit enough in comparison to other sports. What was the sample size? My sample for this dragon boat paddling was the Japanese national team, oh, right, okay. and this was the Malaysian national team. So Malaysia is kick, kick yeah. ass, if you've ever seen them. Mm. They're kick yeah. ass, right? Amazing. Okay, so what we can see is that our aerobic fitness as a sport in general is not comparing to other paddling sports that are similar. Now what's particularly interesting about that is Sarah, when she did her study on metabolism, she actually found that the aerobic metabolism is higher in dragon boat paddling than it is in kayaking. So if we've got a higher aerobic demand in our sport, but we're not as fit, we're really behind the eight ball. So this is a fundamental. This is the primary method of fuel utilization during dragon boat racing is from aerobic metabolism, yet, Dragon boat athletes do not have the fitness of their paddling peers. Number one thing, make sure you're aerobically fit. So the second thing is, from here that kind of hammers home the, the same point, is that we can see, now this is, this is for kayak um, racing, you can see that as the race distance increases, the demand on the aerobic system increases as well. So here we've got, um, this is looking at two different things, ventilatory threshold and time to exhaustion. So time to exhaustion is how much time it took you to die basically on an incremental test that just keeps going and going and going until you've had enough. And that's a really good indicator of aerobic capacity. So at 500 metres, we're looking at, you know, 55. And then it's building up from there right up to, well, obviously we don't do that kind of race distance. But if we're looking at these two in particular, we can see that aerobic metabolism is incredibly important and it gets more important as we increase the race distance.